Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You only need to stand here, and suddenly there becomes quietness and calmness. <laughs> Perhaps it's my persona. Anyway, a warm welcome to our service this morning. If you're a visitor, a special welcome. And if you can stay at the end, we have tea and coffee to enjoy and speak with us. A brief reflection, Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. When was the last time you looked at that banner? If I asked you all to face the other way at the beginning of the service... Could we all remember what was up there? Maybe not. And as we come to God in worship this morning, do you find these words a comfort? Or do you find them a challenge? In our busy lives these days, one of the most difficult things is to be still. We don't often do it. We don't often have the opportunity to do it. We don't always make the opportunity to be still. But these are the words in scripture, be still and know that I am God. And I believe that God wants us to step back sometimes and build on his relationship with us. What better situation than at the start of our worship this morning just to quieten ourselves to be still, to listen. We were praying about this this morning before the service. Listen to what God has to say to us. You know, it's possible this morning he, he could have something really profound or something life-changing to say to you or to me. Be still encourages the hearer, to stop everything, to stop all struggles and find God's peace. Such peace comes only as we acknowledge God's lordship in our lives and surrender, yes, surrender to his will, his perfect will for us. So can we do that this morning, just in this short time together? A brief prayer. God, we are still now. We are quiet. We are listening. Father, we want to acknowledge your lordship in our lives. Our Father, this morning, Whatever the situation may be in our lives, we surrender to you. Make us, mould us into what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our first short song this morning will just give us an opportunity to reflect on what I've been sharing. So I'll pass you over now to our worship group. Thank you. Let's stand and sing. Be still and know that I am and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Same verse. Be still and know that I am God.
everything new Jesus one day you will bind every wound the former things shall all pass away no more tears and one day you'll make sense of it all Jesus one day every question resolved and every anxious thought left behind no more fear when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory one day we will see face to face Jesus is their greater vision of grace And in the moment we shall be changed on that day And one day we'll be free free indeed Jesus one day all this struggle will cease we will see your glory revealed on that day when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory face to face Jesus is their greater vision of grace and in a moment we shall be changed and in a moment we shall be changed and in a moment we shall be changed on that day when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory We'll sing and shout the victory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Please take a seat. What a wonderful hymn. We're now going to have a time of intercessory prayer be a little bit different this morning, a bit more participative. I'm going to work you hard. More participative, but in a silent way. I want us to continue in this attitude of being still 
before God. There are a few topics to pray about. I'll introduce them and then silently, in your own words, we can each bring before God a prayer for that situation. Whatever comes into your mind, whatever comes into your heart, pray silently and allow allow a little opportunity to do that. So let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning to share our prayers, knowing you are a listening God. Father, help us to listen to you as well as to talk to you. Firstly, Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives, for all your gifts showered upon us. And now in our silence, each one of us can bring to you our thanks for something you have done in our lives that we want to thank you for. We bring that before you now. (coughs) Our Father, if there is something not quite right in our lives, we confess and bring this to you now we seek your guidance and forgiveness as we bring this to you now Dear God, we want to bring before you someone in this fellowship in need, perhaps struggling with health issues, relationship issues, or bereavement. Father, we bring that person in love before you now. Father, we now bring to you the needs of someone in our own family who we believe needs your special touch, perhaps struggling in their lives, not knowing where to turn. Father, we bring that person in love before you now. And finally, Father, we confess we live in a broken world where so much is wrong. And we can only turn to you in these circumstances. Father, we know that we can't pray into every situation this morning. But we can each pray into one situation anywhere in the world. Which touches our hearts right now and ask you, our God and Creator, in your will, to intervene. Father, we bring that situation to you now. And so, Father, hear our many prayers offered to you this morning in this church. 
by this fellowship of your believers. And we offer these prayers to you for Jesus' sake and in his holy name. Amen. Stand and sing to our God who is mighty to save, our Saviour who can move mountains. asked us this morning to be still and to know that you are God, to know that you are our God, that you are mighty to save, that you are the God that can move mountains. Lord, if we have come this morning needing a mountain moved, give us the confidence, Lord, and the faith and the hope that you are the God that can move mountains. And Lord, through that faith, might we be able to be still and to know your peace and your presence in our lives, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We, we're now going to have the scripture reading. You'll recall that last week, Ewan said that we would look at, look at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked alone, they were talking about everything that had happened. 
As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, he said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him in to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures wasn't it clearly predicted that the messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory then jesus took them through the writings of moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures and the things concerning himself by the by this time they were nearing emmaus and the end of their journey jesus acted as if he were going on but they begged him stay the night with us since it's getting late so he went home with them As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognised him. And at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn, burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. And just uh, before the children go out, let's just pray a blessing over the children and also over you. Lord, we thank you for the children and young people that are amongst us this morning. We thank you for their um, curiosity to learn, Lord, and we ask that that would be use now as they go to their own classes lord and we just pray for their teachers also that they would speak your words to encourage these young people now and we pray for you and as he brings us his message this morning lord that you would be with him that you would strengthen him and that you would speak your words through him too and for us lord just pray that we would have ears that hear that we would be able to listen to the words that you want to lay on our hearts this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth Planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory teach us Lord full obedience holy reverence true humility test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity cause our faith to rise cause our eyes to see your majestic love 
and authority Words of power that can never fail Let their truth prevail over unbelief Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us Truths unchanged from the dawn of time That will echo down through eternity And by grace we'll stand on your promises And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us Speak, O Lord, till your church is built And the earth is filled with your glory And by grace we'll stand on your promises And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us Speak, O Lord, till your church is built And the earth is filled with your glory Well, good morning, everyone. Speak, O Lord. What a wonderful song as we come to God's Word this morning. Let's just take a moment to pause to still ourselves, to still our hearts as we come to listen to God through His Word. Speak, O Lord. Would you speak to us this morning through your words and through the words that you have placed on my heart? Would you speak to us this morning with your Holy Spirit working in our hearts, opening our eyes to see you? And would you speak to us this morning and give us ears to listen? Speak, O Lord. Amen. Put yourselves in the shoes of Jesus or the sandals of Jesus. I know that might be hard to, to imagine, but put yourself in the sandals of Jesus. You've experienced all that you have over that Easter weekend and before as well. You've had the exhaustion of ministry, of constantly pouring out and pouring out for others. You've had the exhaustion of betrayal the heartbreak, the devastation of your disciples abandoning you. You've suffered, you've bled, you've been put to death on the cross, you've been raised on the third day, you've been walking from Jerusalem alongside these disciples who are walking and talking. And then they have the audacity to turn around to you and say, you must be one of the only ones visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened. I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus in that moment, I would be indignant. A comment like that would have just totally riled me up, like, like a pot on a stove. I would have just been bubbling and boiling over until the water was just bursting everywhere. How can you say that to me? I'm the one who more than anybody knows what has happened these last few days. 
Or maybe I would have pulled a zinger on them and said, ah, well, that's what you think. But little do you know that I've actually experienced all of it because guess who I am? I would have had to get a word in somewhere. Now, if you're anything like me, if you're extroverted, you too probably would have felt that bubbling inside of you and felt, I have to say something. Or if maybe you're a bit more introverted, you wouldn't necessarily have felt the urge to say something, but you would have been thinking about it. It would have been going through your mind and maybe even you would have kind of checked out a little bit as you were riling up inside and you were thinking all the ways that you'd like to respond to this person. But what does Jesus do? How does Jesus respond? How does Jesus walk on the road to Emmaus? That's what we're going to be looking at this week. Last week, we looked at this story as our journey, our journey not only of conversion, but our journey of spiritual renewal, of having our eyes opened and our hearts set on fire. This week, we're going to be looking at this in terms of journeying with others following the model of Jesus. Because while we are not Jesus and we are not in his sandals, in a lot of significant ways, we are not Jesus. Yet, Jesus calls us to imitate him, to follow him and to walk in his footsteps. And so we're going to follow him. We're going to look at Jesus as a model for how we journey alongside others. Alongside others whom we would long to see go from hopelessness to hope, from despair to joy, from questioning and confusion after the events that the disciples have experienced to running to tell others it's true he is risen. He is alive and he is everything and everyone that he says he is. So where does the journey begin for Jesus? Whereas for the disciples it begins as returning to business as usual, for Jesus it begins by saying, well, by saying nothing at all. Verse verse 15 to 16, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Jesus himself comes alongside them and he listens. He listens to them as they're talking to one another. He's close enough to hear them, but he's also slow enough to notice, to notice their body language, stooped stooped over, devastated, to notice the tone in their voice, to notice what they're saying and what it all means for them. This is very different to the way we listen today, isn't it? Just in an article this week from the Gospel Coalition, I read this slightly tongue-in-cheek definition of listening. It's when two people are talking and the first one stops to draw breath. That one is called the listener. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, Life Together, talks about listening as service, listening as an act of love. But when we are only half listening, or when we are listening with the intent to just get our word in, waiting until we can say what we want to say, when we are listening but really not listening because we're distracted or when we're listening but we're actually on our phone. Sorry, what did you say? Oh, oh, I missed that. Or when we're listening but we're really just looking at the background, watching TV. All of that is communicating something to the person that we are supposed to be listening to. Now at this point, 
I have to confess that I am not always a wonderful listener. In fact, at uni, I was so bad at listening at times that one of my friends said it was as if I had white noise going on in the background. (laughs) Ewan has a thought. (laughs) And all of a sudden, people were saying, Ewan, where are you? Wake up. Have you been listening to anything that we've been saying? Now, I use that example from uni because I like to think that I'm a reformed individual and that I'm now really wonderful at listening. And I'm sure Beth would be able to tell you all the many occasions when that's been the case. (laughs) Ha ha, (laughs) absolutely. But we're not very good at listening. As society in general, we're usually not very good at listening because we are distracted I mean, if if Bonhoeffer talked about half listening back in his day, how much more so today when we are surrounded by distractions and when we have one of the biggest distractions you can imagine always to hand or sitting in our pockets? How much more today do we need to learn from the model of Jesus who listens while walking at three miles an hour, going through life at that pace, close enough to hear, slow enough to notice. And it's through Jesus' listening that he's able to ask the right questions. First, what are you discussing together as you walk along? A, A simple, innocent question. Just tell me what you're talking about. I've heard that you're discussing What are you actually saying? And then, an even more simple, yet more powerful question. Simple because it is just two words, and yet powerful because in the asking of it, Jesus offers an opportunity graciously, with with tact and with restraint and with grace, unlike anything that I would have said if somebody had turned around to me and responded like Cleopas did. Just simply asking what things. By asking what things, Jesus provides an opportunity for the disciples to unburden themselves, as one commentator puts it to unburden the loads of the last few days, to unburden their dashed hopes, to unburden their longings, or rather their unrealized longings. It's only then that Jesus is able to show how the gospel connects with their longings. How Jesus is able to show how the gospel tells a story far greater than they can imagine. How what has taken place is far greater than they have just described. In many ways it is as they've described, but it's so much more than that. And yet it began with listening. What would it look like if we at Galashiels Baptist Church were known primarily for being incredible listeners? What would it look like if people who came to our activities or maybe even those who come to our Coronation Street Party came away saying, wow, nobody has ever listened to me like those people have. I've never felt like people wanted to hear what I had to say like those people have. Nobody's ever remembered or picked up on things that I've said and asked me further, what things like those people have? What an act of love. What a demonstration of service to others. The road to Emmaus for Jesus begins walking alongside them slowly and it begins with listening. But it doesn't end there. 
You may have heard this quote, often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Some of you actually will already have a knowing, a knowing smile at this point. It's, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. I might have actually mentioned this before, so apologies if I have. But it's, it's a quote that sounds good. Preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. In other words, don't use words to preach the gospel. Just demonstrate the gospel by your life. Just live a good life. Just be a good person and people will eventually pick up and notice. Just be a really good listener and people will be so intrigued that all of a sudden they'll just come to know Jesus. You don't have to say anything. Don't complicate things. Don't put yourself in the way of things. It sounds good, but there's two problems. The first is, as some of you know, St. Francis of Assisi never said it. So it's a complete misquote. I don't know who said it, but it wasn't him. And often when people put him as their example, it just totally confuses things because St. Francis of Assisi was somebody who lived a life where he did walk slowly, slow enough to notice, slow enough to notice his surroundings, to care for others. But he did also preach the gospel with words. So first, it's a misquote. But secondly, it does not represent the witness of the New Testament. It doesn't represent the model of Jesus that we have here. But there's plenty of other occasions where we find that people speak the gospel, that they don't just live the gospel as important, as crucial as that is, but they also talk. They walk and they talk and they have to make sure that they walk the walk that they're talking. Examples of this include um, uh, Peter when Peter is told that his understanding has not gone far enough. He's given a vision, but he's also counseled, or rather told off, by Paul, who speaks the gospel, who speaks what the gospel means, and who instructs him that he has to change his ways. Because the ways that he is not sharing table fellowship with some people with the Gentiles is communicating a different gospel. But there's a great example as well in Acts where Priscilla and Aquila, a wonderful couple who come alongside Apollos, a a, a teacher who is excited about the gospel and is excited about preaching baptism, but he's only been preaching the baptism of John. His understanding does not go far enough. There is more to the story. There is more for him to learn. And so Priscilla and Aquila invite him to a meal and share with him the fullness of the gospel. Not only the baptism of John, but the baptism of Jesus as well. The New Testament demonstrates both living the gospel and speaking the gospel. And it demonstrates that we need to speak when understanding doesn't go far enough. We need to speak when people's understanding of who Jesus is and who God is isn't really a reflection of the fullness of the gospel when it doesn't reflect the suffering of the Messiah or the fact that Jesus didn't just die, but he was raised to life, bodily raised on the third day or the fact that Jesus calls us to put our faith and trust in him. He calls us like he called the early disciples to follow me. We have to talk. We have to speak of these things as well. It's not enough to just listen. It's not enough to just live. The important thing is that we listen first. That we listen so we know where people are coming from. 
That we listen so we know that what we say and the emphasis that we place on, on God's goodness, on his mercy, on his faithfulness, on his love, it speaks to what they have said to us. It doesn't just come as a bolt from the blue completely randomly, but it speaks to what they have shared with us. And it points to Scripture. It's amazing that Jesus, the risen Lord, who could just turn around to them and say, I'm the one that you're talking about. I'm the one that you're talking about. I should be proof enough. The risen Lord Jesus himself, when he is walking alongside the disciples, points to Scripture. He directs them to God's Word. He directs them to the story of God and his people. He directs them to the fullness of what he has done as spoken about in the prophets, in all of scripture, all of which is concerning himself, all of which points to Jesus, all of which is leading up to and find its fulfillment in what Jesus has done that Easter weekend. Even Jesus points to Scripture. Bonhoeffer again says, We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the words of God. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the words of God. Perhaps then, as we think about what it means to talk to others, To not only listen to others, but to talk. To not only walk the gospel, but to talk of the gospel. Perhaps we can reframe it slightly in a way that isn't quite as daunting. And in a way that isn't quite so, I have all the answers and you need to catch up to me because I'm five steps ahead of you on this journey. We want to be walking alongside people. Close enough to hear. Slow enough to notice. So what if our sharing of the gospel was an invitation together to listen to God? Would that give us a bit more confidence? Would that help us speak out? Would that help us share our faith? If it wasn't just, I have all the answers and let me tell you, but if it was an invitation to listen to God together and especially through his words. That way, it's not all about us having all the right answers. That way, it's about us inviting people on the same journey that we are on, inviting people to discover this Jesus for themselves by opening up his words Sometimes I think we are a bit afraid to encourage people to read the Bible. But God's word is living and active. And when people open it for themselves and read it, and maybe read it with us and we discuss it with them together on the journey, who knows how God could open their eyes to his love through his words. Yes, we believe that Jesus walks alongside us. Yes, we believe that we have his Holy Spirit. But Christ is revealed to us through Scripture. His Spirit leads us into all truth as as the Holy Spirit interprets Scripture to us. Perhaps we need to think about how when we're serving people, when we're listening to people, when we are loving people, we can invite them on the same journey that we are on to be open to God, to listen to him and to discover him through his words. Many of you will be familiar with these little books, Try Praying. A little booklet that helps you over seven days 
to just do exactly that. Try praying. It's an invitation to people who are open to spirituality, but haven't necessarily discovered Jesus Christ and his gospel and the wonderful life that is found in him and only in him. It's an invitation to try praying. And I love how each day there's something that you're invited to try that encourages you to just be open to God. Here's one where it says, go to your front door and say to Jesus, please enter my life today. You are welcome. To be open to God. To be open to listening to him. And I came across this testimony, which I'd love to share with you. This is from Wilson on day six. He says, I suppose I had little or no interest in religion. I was happily married. I was not averse to a few drinks and had gradually become a heavy drinker. One day, my wife Leslie said she said she had something to tell me. She said she'd become a Christian. Wow, I thought, where'd that come from? I started to notice small changes in her. It got me curious. I was skeptical, but was wondering if God was really there. A year later, I was given a copy of the Try Praying booklet. I read it from cover to cover in one go. When I finished reading, I put the booklet down and did something I will never regret. I simply looked up and said to God, Hello? Looking back, that first prayer started me on a journey that has brought a lot of change. The journey involved going to a meeting to find out more, attending an Alpha course, and responding to an invitation to come closer to Jesus. I opened my life to him. On one occasion, I had an amazing experience of God's Spirit, where wave after wave of all I can describe as pure love began to wash over me again and again. I said to Leslie, his wife, it's all true. He's real. To which she replied, I told you he was. I'm no longer a heavy drinker. Isn't that a wonderful story? A story of a man finding hope, transformation, new life, moving away from destructive habits in his life discovering love in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, opening himself to God, giving his life to Jesus and committing to following him. It's a wonderful story of both walking and talking. He saw little changes in his wife, and yet his wife had also told him, I've become a Christian. His wife had told him what had happened in her life. But one of the things I love especially about this story, even even before he's described a journey of going on an alpha course where people would have listened to him and his questions and he would have shared. Even before he'd had that experience, of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon him and of receiving God's love. There was that moment where he simply said to God, Hello? And God listened. God heard him. I'd hate this morning for us to hear a message about walking the walk and talking the talk and and inviting people to listen to God and think, oh, here we go again, another evangelism guilt trip, another I'm not doing enough to tell other people about Jesus. The joy of the disciples when their eyes are opened and their hearts are set on fire should be our joy as well. But our our command to listen to others and our invitation 
to others to listen to God is only because God listens to us. It must be rooted in the fact that God listens to us. Rooted in his love, which he first loved us. God hears us. God hears us when we say hello, when we open ourselves to him. And he hears us when we share with him our burdens. The same God's who was walking alongside the disciples and who said, what things? Is the one who knows all things, who knows everything in your life, and yet who still says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. As Paul says, give your request to God. Because the same God who says what things wants you to give him your burdens. He's listening to you in prayer. Not only does God hear us, but God heard us. When we were crushed by the weight of the consequences of our sin. When humanity cried out, or rather didn't cry out, and yet was going on a vicious cycle further and further away from God, God heard us and he sent us his one and only son. God heard us when we bore the weight of our sin and the consequences of our sin. God heard us and he answered our call. He rescued us from Egypt, the new exodus, He brought us out of our slavery to sin through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God heard us. God hears us. And finally, God hears us when we pray for those we journey alongside. The end of this journey, the disciples have their eyes opened and their hearts set on fire when they see Jesus, when they recognize him. We are called to live out the gospel. We are called to share the gospel. We are called to invite others to listen to God. But we must always remember that we cannot open people's eyes. That we do not have the power of salvation carried within us. Because it is the Holy Spirit. It is God's power. It is God's grace. It is God's strength. It is God's goodness and love that opens people's eyes. Which means we are called to pray. And God hears us when we pray. We pray when we share and when we live out the gospel. Because in prayer we are saying, God, I know that I am not the Savior. God, I know that you are the one who saves. You are the one who opens the eyes of the blind. You are the one who unblocks the ears of the deaf. You are the one. Not me. quote maybe slightly better than the misquoted Francis of Assisi is work and serve as if everything depends on you but pray because everything depends on God give yourself in love and service listen to people listen to people as an act of love invite them to listen to God invite them to be open to his love But always remember that God is the one who opens the eyes of the blind. Just as he has opened our eyes. Because he heard us. He hears us. And so let us listen to him. If we are to invite others to listen to God, we must be alongside them. 
close enough to hear, slow enough to notice, and we too must be listening to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture, which is so rich, so full of depth, so full of imagery that stirs our hearts and awakens our imaginations, that fires up our hearts and our minds that opens our eyes time and time again to see you. Lord Jesus, help us to follow, to follow in your footsteps, to follow the model that you have set before us, to listen to others, to invite others to listen to you, through your words. Always remembering that you, our Heavenly Father, you hear us when we call. You hear us when we pray because through your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the presence of your Holy Spirit with us, we have direct access to you when we pray. Lord, hear our prayers when we pray for those we journey alongside whom we would love to see you open their eyes. Hear our prayers as we long for those we journey alongside to go from hopelessness to hope, to discover that life is found in you, Lord Jesus, to discover the good news of the Messiah's suffering over Easter. Hear our prayer. And as we pray, and as you hear those prayers, I ask that you would stir our hearts and stir our our lives, stir our hearts so that we would be fired up to share you with others. So that we would be fired up to walk alongside others close enough to hear, slow enough to notice. We thank you that you have opened our eyes, that you have unblocked our ears. Help us to listen to you, not only on a Sunday, but each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and close our service this morning by singing our final song, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. The Jesus came into the world preaching the good news of the kingdom. Let's sing a song about that. Hear the call of the kingdom, lift your eyes to the king, let his song arise within you as a fragrant offering of how God, rich in mercy, came in Christ to redeem all who trust in his unfailing grace. Hear the call of the kingdom to the Of life with the mercy of heaven that you. Live.
Let me leave us with these wonderful words from Jesus to his disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Amen. God bless.